Hello, uh, you're very, very welcome to Traz and Atira. Uh, my name is Marcus Howard of Easter Rising Stories. Uh, we're an independent collective of Irish historians who are not going to let the virus get the better of us remembering our Irish history in 2020. We have recently fought against the playground being placed on the 1798 mass grave of the Crappies Acre, which we had a debate on. And um, again, we're finding 1798 under attack. And we're looking tonight at does Ireland need the National 1798 Centre. Just one thing I just want to mention about upcoming talks this week. On Wednesday, we have Sean Collins looking at the unsolved murders on Shrove Tuesday, 1921. So, does Ireland need this National 1798 Centre? Well, the rebellion was a large scale rebellion that occurred throughout much of Leinster, parts of Ulster, even had a French expedition that landed in Mayo. A uh, rebellion cost Ireland over 30,000 uh, Irish men and women and saw many emigrate or be transported as a result of it. One of the best museums, personally, that I visited in Ireland has been the National 1798 Rebellion Centre. It really helped bring the place to life, the, the rebellion to life, and helped inspire. Um, this was a rebellion that helped inspire those who were involved in 1916 as well, it should be remembered. Uh, since last week, we've had a, a petition which has had nearly 7,000 signatures. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background before we start, uh, Wexford County Council were proposing to sell the National 1798 Rebellion Centre. The centre was also under threat of being sold a few years ago. Uh, since Thursday, uh, Wexford County Council have said that the, the proposed sale of the 1798 Centre in Enniscorty will now not go ahead as planned. But what is going to happen to the museum is what we're looking at tonight. You know, what should happen to it? Uh, how can we prevent it from being under threat of being sold again? Um, so all local councillors have been invited to participate um, in this discussion. So in terms of our presenters tonight, uh, Paddy Cullivan, historical entertainer and musician who's toured the country with his 10 Dark Secrets of 1798. He's also uh, toured talks on the 10 Dark Secrets of Michael Collins and has performed at numerous events and has helped like the spark for so many regarding 1798, including me. Uh, he is also currently writing a book on the 10 Dark Secrets of 1798. Uh, Colm O'Rourke, is a native of South County Wicklow. Colm grew up surrounded in the history of the 1798 Rebellion. He's the administrator of two excellent Facebook pages, 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database, which focuses on collecting as many casualties of the period as possible. He also runs Transported and Exiled Irish Database, 1794 to 1806, which compiles those who are transported or exiled with the aim of amassing background information about them from Rebellion period records. And we also have Cathy Keane, who lives in Enniscorty and operates guided bus tours in Wexford and beyond. She's passionate about bringing history to life and promoting Wexford to a wider audience. And she's an excellent tour guide. Uh, Stephen Mc McCracken is Ulster Scots Presbyterian Agri Manager who has compiled three books with a lot more to come on local history. He's also given a talk on the 1798 Battle of Antrim on Traz and Atira. He's also pioneering for a 1798 Heritage Centre for Antrim Town. So, um, oh, by the way, a number of these people have featured on my documentary series, 1798 Year of Blood, which can be found on Easter Rising Stories. So, um, Paddy, I just wanted to ask you first, if that's okay, why is the National 1798 Rebellion Centre so important? Well, um, it was built in 1998 on the bicentenary at a cost of three million pounds. Uh, 1.6 million pounds coming from the EU, another 1.4 million pounds coming from local donation. And it remembers effectively our French Revolution. That's what it was. Uh, our 1798 rebellion is inspired by the, the American and French revolutions. But it's even more important than that, in that it was the first time in Irish history that Protestant, Catholic and dissenter uh, Republicans came together to try and overthrow the system and create equality in the country. Uh, so it was a war between Protestant, Catholic and dissenter Republicans and Protestant, Catholic and dissenter Loyalists. And since then, and before that, we, we kind of had a, the wars were almost religious as well as national. But this is a strange one where, you know, all the communities on the island, in a sense, were involved. So in a sense, the whole island owns this centre. This centre is for them. The other important thing about the centre is, uh, as said in the Irish Times article of 1998, that it was meant as a permanent memorial. So my belief about things like that is, you know, there are certain things that cost money and it's important, you know, 
that they they washed their face and all of that. But I would also argue that there's things like the War Memorial Gardens in Dublin or Aris on Uchtaron, you know, that aren't money making and enterprises. They are essentially owned by the people of Ireland. And part of the social deal is that we pay for them. You know what I mean? That they aren't necessarily about a profit. Um, so whatever we do going forward in terms of the rebellion center and, 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 and how that's funded and all of that, that's something we can discuss later on. But it's important as well, even as a museum, um, because uh, many Irish museums, as we all know, are kind of glass display cases put into banks or into um, convents or barracks. And that's no insult to any of those fabulous places. They're fantastic. But this is actually purpose built. Now, we know it, it was a modern building added onto a, a convent and all of that. But at the same time, the building is kind of designed around the exhibit and the exhibit is designed around the building. And it's very much an interactive uh, exhibit. Uh, I even had people from the Edward Burke Institute onto me saying, uh, this is absolutely fabulous. Like outside of the statue of Edmund, Edmund Burke outside of Trinity, this is the only museum he's actually mentioned in, in the whole country. And of course the Burke debate, uh, the great debate between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine over the validity of the French revolution is one of the big instigators uh, and, and one of the big inspiring debates that goes on before the rebellion. So the rebellion is very sophisticated, remembers an awful lot of things. Now, some Mayo people would like it to be a little bit more national and, and less Wexford centric. But I mean, you know, that we can fight that rebellion or, you know, at a later date. But what I'm saying is that it really does, it is the national center. And when you consider how, how the history and, and in, in the last chapter of my show, The Ten Dark Secrets of 1798, we really, we discover how much of the history has been destroyed and wiped out. Moore Hall, the home of the first president of the Republic of Connacht, uh, John Moore, burnt down in 1923. Frascati House, the home of Lord Edward Fitzgerald. In 1972, a Finnefall minister, Noel Lamas, the son of Sean Lamas, said it was of no historical value. And 10 years later, it was a shopping center. Um, Oliver Bond's house, where all the leadership uh, were captured, and Napper Tandy's home, all in medieval, in the center of medieval Dublin, all of those buildings were destroyed with road widening. So we've lost a huge amount of the fabric, the actual fabric of 1798. So when it comes to things like this, I think it's really, really important that we, we think very, very carefully about moving or getting rid of anything like this. And, you know, especially as it's, it's purpose built. Purpose built, I think, is really uh, a really important thing to maintain and keep. How we do that is, is, is the big question. But, I, you know, we don't get rid of the family silver. We don't get rid of things because they're not washing their face, especially something as important as this. This rebellion doesn't just tell us about the past. It tells us about the possible future because this is where all the communities on the island can own something and own a bit of the history uh, uh, in the future. Okay. Um, Cathy, can you tell me uh, what is currently happening with the 1798 Centre? Well, at the moment, it's due to reopen, uh, thanks to the petition and the uh, decision by Wexford County Council to stop the sale. So that's the good news in the immediate future. As regards its future overall, um, I am about 12 years living in Enniscorthy and uh, a good few number of years I was involved in the fringes of a study that was conducted by Wexford County Council. Uh, the top man there, he is the Director of Services down there, uh, Director of Services with Responsibility for Economic Development and Mr Tony Larkin, he saw fit to give a large sum of money to conduct uh, a, a, an, um, an investigation into basically the Battle of Vinegar Hill. And the first question being, um, did, where did the battle actually take place? Just to confirm that. And the man that was the, the lead of that was uh, Dr. Tony Pollard. Uh, he's one of the leading battlefield archeologists in the world. And after that, then there was like five strands and they were looking at different aspects from uh, actual archeological digs to they got the information from, you know, the Rhodes Authority, the, those LIDAR pictures from the sky to look at the, at the different undulations in the ground and everything like that. And on the day that I drove them over to the hill, I, like I said, I was standing there when Mr. Tony Larkin had said they had secured a lot of the land around Vinegar Hill. And I remember uh, they asked Mr. Uh, Dr. Tony Pollard about the battlefield. And he said, as a battle site, 
in an urban setting, it's very, very well in, uh, intact, which was heartening to hear from somebody who has dealt. And he told us a story where he had been brought in by a similar council someplace in England. And they said, you know, we've got a new um, information centre and we've got a lot of interactive things here. But we want to know exactly where the battle took place. And he did the he did the study just like he was doing on this one in Enniscorthy, and he said that good news and bad news. I found the actual battle with site uh, where it took place, and it's out under your car park. Really. So we with that like we were lucky to say i know that there's been building and um we all know i was telling people about there is a, a little golf course on the foot of it and now there's a school uh two schools and unfortunately all the archaeological um evidence was destroyed for the build because they dug down a little bit further and they went to back in the older archaeological um to look for older things so there was an interest then and at the time and I do believe since that uh, they that they wanted to they want to keep it as it is. But going back to the centre, the centre is, is uh, as Paddy already alluded to, it's a wonderful centre, and I bring a lot of people there, and they come out and they think it's absolutely fantastic. And maybe it's to do with the fact that it was purposely purpose built for just this. Mm. Um, what really is happening with the centre is that. Uh, there is money due for a tourism product at any score of the, in the town, and the town has been designated the tourist hub of Wexford, not Gorey, not New Ross, yeah. and not Wexford Town. It's in Escorthy because, along with the 98 story and Vinegar Hill, they have a lot of other strings to their bow, and they mightn't be the most, um, you know, I suppose, exciting, but there is a lot of history, of course as well as the, the 1916 Rising being uh, the, one of the biggest towns, the big towns to rise outside of Dublin. And so we have that. And of course, there's, uh, there's other strings to their bow in the town. So what the plan really is, is they are looking for um, buildings surrounding the castle in the, in the town centre, and they want to place the centre in there. Now, there's a number of buildings and there's things going on with them. That, I think, is their ultimate aim, to bring the centre into the centre of town. And but the problem is, I don't know what's happening, why this money hasn't arrived and why they aren't purchasing or CPOing some of those buildings. Most of them are empty. And in Wexford County Council, in their wisdom, have just decided to basically they were trying to just sell it up, box it, shelve it, store it and give it a room in, in the castle for a mention. Uh, until such time as this other place, to, you know, comes out, and that what was happening. I do believe that they they weren't going to close it forever, but they had no regard for it by just shutting it down, like I said, and boxing it up. And that's what happened to the castle and its contents of the museum years ago. It was closed for about six or seven years. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Paul, um, could you tell me about the petition? Um, the petition started on the day. The Slaney News article came out about the, the, the closure, or about the sale. And we just basically said to ourselves, here we go again, this is 2018 all over again. So we just, we decided to set up a petition and encourage as many people to sign it. Now, in fairness to everybody, and there's nearly 7,000 people have signed it so far, everybody did play a massive part in promoting this petition. Paddy was unbelievable with getting this petition out all across Twitter and, and, and elsewhere. Everybody played their part in sending it to friends on Messenger and WhatsApp and so forth. It was discussed everywhere. It got into the local media and, and eventually onto the national media, which was fantastic. And um, it, it grew from there. Like it, it, I, I couldn't believe that it. it was to get 7,000. I believe the petition two years ago was only two and a half thousand or so. But we had a massive response all across Ireland, not just Wexford, um, and even across the world, which is fantastic. Okay. Okay. Um, Stephen, um, I wanted to ask you, what would you like to see happen to the 1798 centre? Hey, in there, Marcus. Um, well, for a start, I think it should be a centre for the whole of Ireland, you know, and not so much dependent on Wexford and maybe tourists and educate in Wexford, maybe some stuff, some other stuff in there, maybe from up here in Antrim. 
Okay. I mean, the location itself, it isn't great for us. I've, I've never actually been doing myself, but yeah. I was hoping to take a group from Antrim here, a group of counsellors down to, to see how they do it. But maybe yeah. that's, not, that's not the best thing to do if it, is, if it is struggling at the minute. I mean, I think making a, a centre for the whole of Ireland, which is, it's, it's called a national, national centre, you know, so it can only be a draw. And I suppose when you see adverts on TV, you see the Giants Causeway up here, but you don't see the this centre down in Wexford, and you sort of wonder why. I'm saying that maybe it's too big for purpose. Maybe there should be two or three wee offshoots of the national centre in places like up north here. We, we don't have anything at all. Maybe volunteer run so it's not dependent on finance from the uh, from the Muller, the national centre down in Wexford. I think that maybe what we might look at maybe doing, you know, in the future. Yeah, like a museum dedicated to the Battle of Antrim, maybe. Yeah, okay. yeah. oh, yeah, that's that's what we hope to do. And we're sort of gathering up, gathering up momentum at the minute through the press and local local councillors, you know. Okay. Um, I suppose if it wasn't financially struggling, we wouldn't be here. And you sort of have to look at it as a building. And how do you get that build? How do you make that building more financially sta- sustainable and make it so as it doesn't become an issue in the future, maybe two years' time. Maybe bring in, bring in other charities to fill up rooms, get the foot flow increased. Yeah. Stuff they got there, maybe. Okay. Um, Paddy, what do you think can be done to increase the numbers that are coming to the centre? Well, I think, funny, Stephen brings that up there. I mean, and it's a funny thing about Northern Ireland too, or the North of Ireland. Uh, we only sell certain things in this country. And we, we like, first of all, for politically sensitive reasons, and we only we like to sell things like the Titanic Museum. We sell the Guinness Storehouse. We sell the Giant's Causeway. And yet, a, a couple of summers ago, uh, Colm Dorr brought me to Downpatrick. And Downpatrick Jail is an unbelievable museum. It's fantastic. The grave of Thomas Russell is down the road. There's a wonderful display to do with 1798, but also, the, the, the ecclesiastical stuff, St. Patrick is buried there, Column Kill, St. Bridget. You could ask a million people in Ireland if they knew where St. Patrick is buried and they couldn't tell you. So th- it's not that these places aren't amazing. And Stephen's correct. It should be part of a network. I believe there should be a network of 1798, almost like a trail, like the Wild Atlantic Way. Mm-hmm. I, I, call it from down, I call it from Down Patrick to Down Patrick Head and of course taken in Antrim. But essentially you know, you want to be able to follow the path of Humbert to Balnamuck and back to Kalala. You want to be able to come down to Wexford and up to down in Antrim. You know, there's wonderful sites everywhere to do with this. But the big problem is, and, you know, I I said this today in the Irish story, history, despite all our best efforts here, all of us here, um, it's just not given the seriousness in in Ireland that, that it should be given. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, you know, our national broadcaster should be broadcasting history shows every single day. Barry Shepherd does a 26 minute show once a week on NBTV up in Belfast. We don't even have a half hour history show once a week on RTE1. I mean, it's incredible. And we're selling aspects of Irish, Irishness and then something that might be a bit hard politically like rebellions and stuff like that. We kind of put that on the back burner. We talk about it at centenary time and then we leave it and pack it away. And that's not... You know, they talk about maturity in Ireland and how we need to be mature and all of that. We need to actually sell every aspect of it. I was, I was looking today at Wexford and how it's sold tourism-wise. And what you get is, you know, all the separate things, Dumbrody Famine Ship, 1798 Rebellion Centre, all separate, all another thing. I think you need to collect it all together and say, no, what happens is you arrive in Enniscorthy and you're doing the yeah. 1798 tour. You go to the centre. Then you go to Cathy's there in the car park. She brings you up to Vinegar Hill, over to Owlert Hill, then to Bula Vogue. As Stephen was saying there, there's another centre in Bula Vogue to do with Father John Murphy. And that way you get this, a wonderful sense, a kind of an almost 3D geographical sense of what's going on. I know, I know up and down in Antrim, Eamon Phoenix sometimes goes out and brings people on bus tours to show them the rebellion sites, to go to Balna, um, I think it's Balna Hinch, you know, um, St. Field, places like that, Antrim. And again, it's about putting it, but it's also putting it into the national consciousness, not just finishing history when you're in school, but making it part of who we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kathy, 
you're an excellent tour guide and Paddy raises some interesting points there. Why do places like Hook Head, Wells House, JFK Centre get large volumes of tourists while the 1798 Centre and maybe Father John Murphy Centre don't get as much as they should get? In your own opinion, like. Uh, just if you want to unmute yourself there, Kathy. No, Kathy, your microphone's still um, up at bottom left. Oh, there you go. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. First of all, uh, would you believe that the Hook Peninsula is pretty much separate from Visit Wexford? And I believe for, they have had their own tourism uh, promotional uh, group for many years, quite separate from anything else. They, they, they are a registered charity, as okay. far as I know. So all the money that's made at the Hook Lighthouse uh, goes back into tourism. And they get, they get funding for, as a charity would you believe? So that's why they have all, they've always done very well with tourism. And um, with regard to, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, so they, they, they operate quite well. I do find that the, the, the county, um, I don't know if you could call it larger than other counties in the sense that there's big towns and it's, they tend to be very much each town for themselves and they haven't brought the whole product of Wexford. Wexford has always been seen as the sunny southeast and strawberries. It was never seen, seen in terms of history and that's what caught my attention when I came here from the Norman story which I love to do and uh, the, the, the 1798 and just on the point what Paddy said there I do have a tour I, I worked for a year with a gentleman in England he's an Irishman doing the Father Murphy footsteps tour so we basically followed I did a tour where I drove people around starting in uh, ferns just before um, they handed up their arms out over to Bula Vogue the burning of the church and we can go to North Cork Lane and there's a church in Owlert, which is very similar to the one that was burnt in uh, Bula Vogue. And it was, re, re, it was actually burnt, I think, in September 98. And then it was um, rebuilt. So I am there. And, uh, you know, I, I could, this could be developed into an app. But, like, there, there doesn't seem to be any appetite. It's like, aren't you very good, Cathy? That's really wonderful. And then that's it. And they just have the mini farms, which are there. They just seem to just focus totally on food and, um, and the farms and activities. And the real history is just not sexy enough, maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, Stephen, uh, how can the Heritage um, Centre, you know, you were saying about like including other areas, but is there anything that the Heritage Centre in Wexford could do that would appeal to you maybe coming down from Antrim or somebody from another area that would have it like Mayo for example coming to visit Wexford for 1798? Well I think mainly advertising for a start. To be honest with you I don't think the majority of people up here even know it exists. You yeah. know as I was saying you get all these big fancy adverts by uh, Tourism Ireland which cover the whole of Ireland but you never see this heritage centre, the a National Heritage Centre ever being mentioned and I certainly didn't know about it until, and I wouldn't have known about it unless it was into my 1798 rebellion stuff, you know? Yeah. So I think really advertising is the main thing. But then again, you have to wonder, you, your last, uh, Kath was saying there that there might not be a, enough passionate people around it, I think. And maybe it does need to go down the charity way, that if it's charity, people run it and fund it. You're going to get the passion through the charities, and um, I think maybe that be better than civil servants. You know, I think. Yeah. Well, the, the staff that I find there have been incredibly helpful. I mean, to me, I mean, in terms of filming around there, and I mean, they've been very, very welcoming. Like they, they are brilliant. Um, uh, but Colin, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you have covered everywhere in terms of the 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database. You've looked at every area. Um, should other areas, in your opinion? Be included in the uh, National Seventeen Ninety Eight Rebellion Centre, like Connacht, Ulster. What do you think? Can Colm hear us there? Your microphone, Colm. Can you unmute Colm, Marcus? Yeah. Hi, Colm. You should be able to unmute yourself there now. 
No, um, Paddy, I'll ask you just while I'm waiting for Colm, what do you think about yeah. that? Do you think like other areas, how could you attract other areas to, to maybe come to the National 1798 Rebellion Centre? Well, okay, let me, from my experience, okay, so I tried to run a satire festival with local people in Trim. Yeah. And it went, it went okay. Uh, but the most successful town in Ireland I've seen for running anything is Kilkenny. Yeah. And there's a reason why. Uh, when Richard Cook puts on festivals there like Kilkenomics or the Cat Laughs or anything like that, the whole town is geared up for it. All the pubs, all the hotels, all the accommodation, everybody knows what's going on. Everyone's clued in. Everyone's saying, okay, when you're done here, head down there. You know what I mean? This is no insult to any business or any tourism person or any practitioner in the center itself. This is to say that if we're all operating like, like single operators the whole time, you know, you, you can't live as an island. You know what I mean? E everything you do. Hotels seem to be about pints and bed nights and eat your dinner in the hotel and don't go anywhere outside the hotel. The hotel need to be saying, okay, up the road we've the 1798 Rebellion Centre. We all know the history. We've all been there. It's fantastic. Really, try it out. Not yeah. just a couple of flyers in the hotel lobby. Yeah. You know, yeah. The whole town has to be selling itself, if you know what I mean. It's almost like they have to do a training course, the whole town. I don't mean that. I'm not insulting an escorty here. I'm just saying all towns in Ireland need to do this. Because, you, know, yeah. you know, we've been to Kalala before. We've yeah. been to, to other towns that you think Kalala would be an explosion of 1798 stuff. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and Bar Steve Dunford and the Wolf Dog Tavern, you know, there's a lack of a sense of that. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And... And, and I just seen, I just think things shouldn't be operating in isolation. There should be, the way we're doing here, and the way we kind of have over the COVID thing, I mean, one of the great benefits of what happened is a lot of us have met up, a lot of us have kind of formed this coalition. And I think that's what made the, the petition a success. But in that same sense of togetherness and uh, dare I say, United Irishmen and, and a fellowship, uh, Irish towns need to do that. And just don't be selling the pints and the bed nights alone and telling them, oh, it's a great place to bring the kids. Like kids would love the 1798 Rebellion Centre because it's full of, you know, sorry, violence and, and imagery and holograms and wonderful stuff. And it's really exciting for kids, you know. And, and we have to stop thinking of history as some kind of musty, fusty thing. You know, it's very exciting. The 1798 Rebellion makes Game of Thrones look like friends. It's an <laughs> exciting thing. It's, it involves France. It involves America. American tourists should be flooding the place. Mm -hmm. um, French tourists, of which there's half a million a year, and now because of Brexit, they're our nearest neighbour. The French should be totally aware of this. When, when the petition got to the consuls of, Fran of, of France here in Munster and Connacht, they, were, they, were, they couldn't believe this was happening. Uh, the French ambassador, a lot of different people have a lot of interest in this keeping going. But I understand it is about footfall. And even with the 6,000 to almost 7,000 signatures now, we've told 7,000 people about the centre. It's been in the Irish Times, all mm. of that. But that, that needs to continue, that level of awareness and also, let's get people excited about the place. You know what I mean? I know that every show that I do, when gigs ever come back, but every show I do, I'll be telling people to go to it. Absolutely. Uh, Colm, let's try and bring you in there again, just see if the microphone's working. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, or if we go on ahead. What do you, are your thoughts about bringing other areas, uh, being interested, I suppose, in the National 1798 Centre? How would you do it? Well, if you want to entice tourism and people from all across the world, like it's all great having a, a centre in Wexford if you have Wexford ancestry but just people there come up to the centre and visit who have ancestry from Connacht and Ulster and Munster and all around the country so yeah they'd, they'd be more interested if they were to see George Blake there from Galway or, or um, Henry Monroe from County Down even the lesser known people of the 1798 Rebellion um, indeed like it, it touches off a bit of every aspect of the rebellion, but not in as much detail as it does for Vinegar Hill. I know I understand Vinegar Hill is only outside. When you walk out the door, you can see it, but it's, if it's going to be a national centre, you're going to have to incorporate the the rebellion from all across the country. Like not just mm -hmm. the, the uh, three other provinces, but like, as far as I'm concerned, the casualties of the Castle Hill uprising in Australia, they're, they're important to be mentioned here because it is part, it is a ripple of the 1798 rebellion. You have the Newfoundland uh, attempted uprising in 1800. You, um, there's just so many different aspects to the rebellion. You have naval battles, clashes happening all across uh, the Atlantic and 
Celtic Sea all throughout the the autumn and winter of 1798. French ships going back after uh, the Battle of Tory Island. And I have several of those casualties. It's not just Wexford, it's not just Wicklow, and it's not just um, a few of the counties in the Midlands and North East. This rebellion, as, we, as we've talked about before, you have casualties all across Ireland. Uh, it's it, it has to be... The title National 70 Rebellion Centre really has to be defined. The national part has to be defined a lot more stronger than just... Just because it's in Enniscorty doesn't mean it's a Wexford centre. Mm. Well, like, uh, I'm a Wicklow man, but of Wexford heritage, but I, I, I'd still be... I'd still love to see more done from across the... Uh, more uh, exhibitions and, and displays there for what happened in Westmeath, Longford, uh, Kerry, Cork, and so forth, you know? Well, I mean, I, I would like to say as well, just like, I mean, any museum is limited by the space that they have as well and, you know, how much they can include. Um, from, from my point of view, what happened to me in terms of encountering that centre was I went to Paddy Cullivan's show then in Enniscorty. He really gave me the bug for it. Uh, he told me about the centre. I went to, I didn't know about this beforehand. Like, I knew all about 1916 to 22. And if you look at even the casualty figures in 1798, there's so many people compared to even something like 1916. Um, what do you think, Cathy, are the best features of the National 1798 Rebellion Centre? Well, first of all, I have to mention the staff. The staff themselves are absolutely fantastic. I agree. And they go between the castle, and it's called the castle, and the, and the 98 Centre, and they're fluid that they're able to do a guided tour in each location. Yeah. Um, so you you mentioned there about promotion. Just remember that 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 there's one staff member there, or two staff members, literally on Facebook or on YouTube, or not even YouTube, but they're on social media trying to promote it. So that's about the level of promotion that it does and gets. Yeah. And that's down to the the staff the staff member. Um, and I'm sorry, I forget the question. <laughs> no, it was just, what do you think is the best feature of the museum? Oh, the feature. Well, first of all, um, it, it start out, the car park is decent. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's uh, so that's, uh, that's always handy. So they're able to take one or two or three big coaches. In the centre itself, then, it isn't uh, just, it, like, the, 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 when the guide, he'll take you into the, the inside area. And again, like I said, they're very, very... Um, dedicated to their job. They start you off, so it's a one-on-one. -on -one. Then you go downstairs. It's interactive in the sense that, uh, that there's the, the, the sort of a, what you call the mannequins in there who actually talk to you. And you get a, a feel, especially um, the, the young boy, and he's talking to you. And you're going with them to the battle tomorrow. I yeah, mean, I it's very, what, it's, yeah. it, it really hits a, a nerve, you know? And, then you go into this the cinema type environment and the, the sound is coming at you from all sides yeah and you, it places you there then when you leave you've got a continuation of the story and then at the end you can dress up there yeah. are the costumes there so it, it is really it, it it does it's not just you go into the museum and you look up at a picture you know i, I went one time and i and i know they were just doing their best but it was a famine house and um it literally was just all photocopy pictures on a wall you know so yeah. that's what that's what this is this is so important this center and um listening to what Stephen McCracken was saying there that it's ironic that people in the north of Ireland you know or any part of Ireland have not heard of the 98 center so maybe perhaps pure uh adver more advertising would be a simple solution yeah you know but they have to be given the resources to do this the center okay um, the other thing that it would be interesting to ask, um, just in terms of what's happening, and let's try and keep it supposed to the debate on topic in a sense, can somebody tell me who owns the centre? Is there anybody who'd like to take that question? Or who is trying to sell it and to whom? Well, it's owned by Wexford County Council. Okay. I believe that the land was, that the building was given, it was belonged to the, the Christian Brothers, which still have a school next door. Okay. And the building was given to the people of Enniscorthy, just like other new, uh, the, the Athenaeum say in the town also was given by the church. And so the, the Wexford Council Council took it on and the money was raised, as Paddy was saying earlier on, and they developed this centre. So it's in the hands of the Wexford County Council. They run it. 
but the actual ownership would be the people of Ireland or the people of Wexford. Okay, so then who was trying to, so Wexford County Council were trying to sell it to, who were they trying to sell it to or? Um, it is believed that it was being sold to, well now it's, it seems to be the son of a, a local businessman. Okay. And the same, same businessman has purchased St. Sennan's Psychiatric Hospital, which is now gone, uh, across the river. And just to bear in mind that a new bridge is planned for the River Slaney, and it will be coming in apparently just at where the, the grounds of the 98th Centre, and they were supposed to be taking, they are supposed to be taking some of the, the land, now there's not much, some of the ground away. Mm -hmm. And in recent months, they took away, uh, there was a United Nations um, monument, sorry, th th three plaques there. And I was there when they installed them and there was a big, uh, obviously a big do. And then about four years later, they took it all up and it's gone down to a new park in the town. Okay. in preparation for some of this property to be taken for this roundabout or bridge or something there. And just last thing, and I'll just open it up to, to everybody. Uh, what is going to happen to the centre? I know they say it's going to be saved, but then what? Do you know, is, is there going to be a, a next plan maybe from Wexford Council or? Well, like, uh, you know, I do believe there is a vision there somewhere in the council that it is going to be put in, like I said, into the centre of the town. And they will maybe CPO some of the buildings. There's a nightclub, a ballroom, which is at the back of the Athenaeum. I don't for people who haven't been there, you've got, if you're looking at the castle, you have the Athenaeum just to the left. Okay. Well, at the back of the Athenaeum, there's a very, very large ballroom that hasn't been used in numerous years. And the, the talk was it would be placed in there and this will become the tourist centre. And I do believe that they will carry this out. But when is the question, number one? Yeah. And, and I, my fear was not only would they sell it, but they would box it. But I think that's the ultimate aim of the council. OK. Um, I just open this up to the floor. Um, let's see. Marianne Mayer has raised, raised a really interesting point. It's interesting that there were 142,877 visitors to the four guided OPW sites in Wexford alone in 2018. It would be interesting to see what was the footfall into the 1798 Rebellion Centre and could more be done to align with the OPW sites in order to filter more people from these sites to Enniscorty. That's a great point. Um, Bianca McDonough has said it'd be such a shame to go. She visited several times last time in November with the Independent Tour Guide Association and it's incredible. Um, let's see, Limo Sullivan, 30,000 people died in the cause of Irish freedom. Why is that an opportunity that any other county would exploit as an opportunity to share our history? It's seen as a milestone around Wexford, Wexford's neck by the County Council. Paddy is spot on. This is a huge opportunity to have a history trail right across Ireland. Tourism Ireland should be all over this. Open more, don't shut this down. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Paddy, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to address in terms of the 1798 Centre? Well, it's just actually to support what um, Colin was saying there. Uh, for the genealogy thing is huge business. And it's really important that, you know, uh, I think, Colin, you put up a thing once that, you know, John Wayne is related to United Irishmen. There's a lot of American presidents who are descended from United Irishmen. I know in my show doing it that uh, uh, Lorcan Sir came to the show one night. He writes for the Sunday Times, fantastic man on housing, lecture in UCD. Direct descendant of Major Sir who shot Lord Edward Fitzgerald. Napper Tandy's great great grand nephew is a DJ in, in England. His name, he calls himself Napper Tandy. The Emmets are all over America. Uh, like, like, there's a direct link with people. But there's another aspect too. And uh, John Concannon, uh, in another life, as a man who put together the gathering and stuff like that, he, he did, you know, the, the Wild Atlantic Way is a fantastic idea. Ireland's mm -hmm. ancient piece is a fantastic idea because what you're doing is you're bringing people on a journey. And I think they like that. And, you know, you can bring people to Enniscorthy. Uh, if you have a 1798 rebellion tour that goes across the, the, the country, you can bring people to eat food. So you're not leaving the restaurants out. They can stay overnight in the hotels, but they're part of an experience. And, I mean, the rebellion centre itself is an amazing experience. And also what Stephen's saying as well, no consciousness in the north about it. But the north, of course, only sells three tourist packages really to us as well. We need to open that up. A lot more and I love what Stephen's talking about even 
you know, in Antrim and having a, having a center there and stuff like that, because, you know, we, we just had the statue of Henry Joy McCracken go up in Belfast. That's right. You know, first United Irishman statue, I think, in the north. And, you know, we're slowly getting to the point where we can actually make this into a wonderful experience for everybody and, and a fantastic period of history. Because they do have a 1798 Rebellion Center in Balnamuck. Uh, although every time I've been, it, it ha- hasn't been open, but just in terms of being yeah. luck, I suppose, in terms of visiting. Um, Stephen, do you have any kind of final thoughts on the 1798 Center itself? Is there anything that you'd like to bring up, maybe? Just really the advertising. You know, advertising. no one knows about it up here. And fuck me, you could get busloads going down to it from Belfast, I think. A lot of about you were saying there about, or someone was saying about the hotels and all, but I think hotels mm. up here are working with tour guides, and mm. you know they're they're sorry, they're coming on and working together now. I think I think maybe Don will tell you more about that in the comment maybe, but uh, no, definitely all about advertising. If it's so good and the way cafe is portrayed it there, it seems to be a brilliant experience. Mm. It's unfortunate that it may in some time, maybe five years' time, move to that ballroom site, you know. But then again, if it's got all the amenities it has now in the ballroom site, sure, why not? If it if it increases the fit flow and keeps the whole thing alive, and it's all about educate, educating. And Colin was on about, are you on about genealogy there? It's making it personal, bringing out who, who was fighting, you know, who was there, yeah. and getting all them names of folk, and then who's here now, and I think it's, I know in my wee book, I did, uh, I did, uh, I tried to see who the famous people were, came from the Battle of Antrim. And I was just amazed at some of the people, you know, you have, you have two or three American presidents and you have John Wayne and a number of other people, you know, uh, you've got a all black, you know, it's, it'll appeal to all the world if you have all the, all the different genealogy lines. Well, you can't have them all done, but it'll be easier when you know who the names are, you see where they're from, then you can see if there's anybody famous from there. And you have John Wayne, like, you know, yeah, he's yeah, going to be the best at the minute, but big attractions. Also, also on, the curious thing, there, the, the curious thing is um, that Steve Dunford has pointed out is that all the 79 Day Rebellion sites seem to correlate with ancient sites as well. So you're actually bringing in ecclesiastical sites. You've got Dan Patrick itself, St. Patrick Head, they're, they're all to do with St. Patrick, Tara, Hill, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So you're bringing in other aspects of history. You're bringing in very beautiful parts of Ireland too. So you're selling very beautiful, a, a beautiful trail as well. So, you know, um, it, it doesn't have to exclusively just be one thing. It, it can be about giving people a real experience. And I mean, Cathy's the one to sell that because the, the tour she does driving you around is second to none, you know? Yeah. Because even um, what Stephen, what, what, what you were saying there was, um, like even uh, Michael Collins' family have alluded to having 1798 relations that are involved in the Battle of Big Cross, you know, and to maybe explore maybe that area of it, as you say, famous people would definitely be a, the hook to get people interested in then studying about 1798, mm-hmm. as in, what is this rebellion that they didn't know about? Because a lot of people who, even 1916 relatives, wouldn't know as much about 1798, but if you look at the 1916 witness statements, they are all looking at 1798. That inspired them. Um, just to read out a few comments, Frank McGuigan, uh, never knew about it, looking forward to visiting. Bianca McDonough, Kathy, I know exactly where you're coming from. I have the same problem here in Carlo. I'm running Carlo tours since 2013, but nobody in Carlo takes it seriously. I started doing tours in Carlo and surroundings, but got no support whatsoever. Now I'm bringing tours all around Ireland. Um, hotels could offer vouchers for the Rebellion Centre. Like when you have a three course meal, you get a voucher for the centre. Um, Anne-Marie McNaughton, Geoditch, we have a culture group in Cushendall, County Antrim. I've never seen any advertisements for the centre. We would be v- interested in visiting. Uh, the feature that hit a nerve with me is the battlefield, says Bianca. You really get the feel that you're in the middle of it. Really well done. Seamus Duffy, thank you. Um, Connor O'Dullohan, I love the concept of an all-Ireland history trail. Donald Kelly, as an Antrim-born Belfast-based tour guide, I would like to see some satellite 1798 centres around Ireland, and especially in Antrim town, something myself and Stephen McCracken are looking at, and it should be a national 1798 trail over Ireland. Uh, William Martin Cullerton, uh, 
he did, his uncle uh, Ned did a great job with the Heritage Park, wishing you every mm. success and saving the project. Larry Scallon, I know the memorials and monuments are very topical in the country right now. I would hope that the presence of the 1798 Centre means much more than tourists. Its potential to encourage active participation and engagement in our shared history goes way beyond bricks and mortar. Uh, Bianca, nearly here, multi-period sites are great to get people interested in history. And Seamus Duffy, may I suggest that the 1798 Centre could be used to bring together the divided community in Northern Ireland, as all involved were opposed to ill treatment in Ireland by the British. Uh, more public awareness, this could be done by the tourist organisations North and South. It's a good idea, actually, um, cross-border community. May I suggest 1798 Centre could be used to bring together the divided community in Northern Ireland, as all involved were opposed to ill treatment in Ireland by the British. More public awareness, this could be done by the tourist organisations North and South. Um, and John Tara existed before St. Patrick, one of the oldest assembly points. It's interesting what Seamus says, you know, about, um, you know, Catholic, Protestant, the centre and, well, this centre, uh, the National 1798 Centre, uh, this is a really bad pun, that but was um, it was very bad. I think we'll end it on that. I'll get my coat. Uh, what was I going to say to you folks? Uh, if there's nothing else, I just would like to say thank you so much for being a part of it and raising awareness for something that really would be a shame to go and one of the things I want to just maybe uh, make clear is that in no way are, am I knocking the 1798 Rebellion Centre by having this debate. It's because I like it so much. I'd like it to be kept. I really think the staff are lovely and wonderful people. And I would hate to see it go, you know. Um, Could I just say one yeah. more thing before we go? Um, since we have some people on who weren't aware of the 98 Centre, they're probably not aware of a wonderful place called the Bula Vogue Centre. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's where uh, Father Murphy lived while he was a curate in Bula Vogue. And the people in that community have just done so much to keep the, the, the story of 1798 alive. The centre is wonderful. It's, one, it's run by a man called Padraig Sinnott. Um, the centre, it's, it's, it's used also as well for the locals to come in on the cold winter nights, the old folks. It's used as a house of stories during the summer months. And um, mm. they've done great things, again, as a community setting, and they get no tour buses. I shouldn't say tour, but they don't get a lot of tour buses. So if, if Stephen and, and people from the north were thinking of coming down, that's another place that they could put on their list and link the sites, as Paddy was saying, all over Ireland. And I have to mention the Bula Vogue Centre. Absolutely. It is a great centre as well. I visited there too. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And thanks for visiting. And we shall see you again on Wednesday. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.